yourself trying to deal with a situation so painful. It just keeps cycling in and out of your thoughts and almost hijacking your emotions. A day can start out so great and then in a moment, an unexpected trigger just sends you spiraling in pain. And you start to wonder, am I ever gonna find healing and peace again? I understand. In the past several years, my family and I have been through a really devastating season. And through a series of heartbreaking events, my marriage imploded. I was so caught off guard and, and honestly in a state of shock, and not just for a few months. It was like the pain and uncertainty was never gonna go away. It lasted over two years. And I think the constant hurt upon hurt made entertaining bitterness and resentment more and more appealing and honestly just seemingly justifiable. Putting my marriage back together seemed beyond impossible. And just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I was diagnosed with several life-threatening illnesses, including breast cancer. I covered much of my journey in my last book, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way. And I really was not sure if I'd ever write another book. But as I finally picked up the pen again and scribbled basic thoughts around what I'd been learning during this long season of pain, forgiveness seemed to be such a present need in my life. You can always know that I'm gonna write for my struggles, not necessarily my strengths. So I started writing about forgiveness. But what seriously started tripping me up when I started studying what the Bible teaches about forgiveness was my sudden realization of how my need for fairness makes me so resistant to this idea of forgiveness. Forgiveness sounds really nice and spiritually mature until you're the one that has to give it. And then giving it to people who've deeply hurt me, well, that became incredibly problematic. I would imagine you understand. Why would God ask the ones who've been so hurt to then be the ones to extend forgiveness. It's hard. And I think it's important that you hear me say that because just the word forgiveness can bring to mind all the people who've hurt us. And then attached to those people are some of the most difficult and sometimes traumatic memories of our lives. But what if forgiveness isn't supposed to be another hard thing we have to do? What if it's that forgiveness is that necessary step that we need to take to finally experience the peace we desperately want but can't get any other way? What if forgiveness is what's been missing in all the relational chaos that we're all just so worn out from dealing with in our lives? That's why we're gonna do all this hard and holy work of forgiveness together. In forgiving what you can't forget, in this study, we're gonna learn how to move on even when the other person refuses to change and never says they're sorry. Together, we're gonna to walk through a step-by-step -step process that will help us get free from the hurts of our past and feel less offended today. We're gonna to discover what the Bible really says about forgiveness and the peace that comes from living it out right now. We're also gonna identify what's stealing trust and vulnerability from our relationships so that we can believe there's still good stuff ahead. And maybe one of the most significant to me is that we're gonna disempower the triggers hijacking our emotions by learning how to embrace the two necessary parts of forgiveness. Now, I do have to say, some of this journey will not be easy but it will be beneficial. And rest assured in this process, I will never judge your resistance to forgiveness because I will be too busy trying to manage my own issues. But together, I think we're gonna learn a lot and finally understand why forgiveness is one of the most crucial and beautiful gifts from God. Each week, I'm gonna give you a statement to hold on to because really, this study on forgiveness, it's not one to just read. It's one I think we're gonna to wanna to sit with. So let me go ahead and give you the statement for week one. Forgiveness is not made possible by our determination. Forgiveness is made possible by our cooperation with what God has already done for us. Now let's get started with session one.
One day when some of my team showed up to the gray kitchen table for a writing session about forgiveness, I told them with absolute certainty, I'm not the one to write this book. I think someone needs to write a book on forgiveness because it is painfully clear that I need to read a book on forgiveness, but I'm not supposed to write it. And just in case they didn't believe me, I picked up a list where I'd written out all the categories of people that I still needed to forgive. And I felt like this made a pretty strong case. I for sure did not need to write this book. Number one, people who hurt me and who have asked for forgiveness, and I'm still wrestling through it, that's okay. Number two, people who've hurt me, but they've not asked for forgiveness because they think I'm the one who is wrong. You better back it up, I will cut you. Number three, people who have hurt me and have not asked for forgiveness because they don't think what they did was wrong. Stop it right now. Number four, people I'm resistant to forgive because my need for justice is just too strong. Number five, people who I'm hesitant to forgive because they may abuse my grace or use it against me. Number six, people who don't even realize they hurt me. Number seven, people who have a pattern of hurting me over and over, no matter how many times I've forgiven them. Number eight, people with whom I had a conflict years ago, and I no longer do life with them. So it's just this awkward tension of unresolved angst because I probably need to forgive them. Number nine, people who can't seem to receive the forgiveness I've offered. So they've just distanced themselves. Number 10, people who simply don't believe it's possible to give or receive forgiveness. And so they're not even willing to participate in any conversation. Number 11, people from whom I need to ask for forgiveness and I haven't done so yet. Number 12, people from whom I need to ask for forgiveness but they have flat out refused me. Number 13, people I've hurt that I don't even realize I've hurt and honestly, this list could go on and on and on. You see, I'm not the one to write this book except for the fact that since I struggle with forgiveness, I can write it with the appropriate amount of angst that a message like this deserves. I'm sure some of you could probably tell of horrific things that have happened to you. And I would imagine you hear the word forgiveness and you pull back, you kind of just cross your arms because you desperately want to self-protect because it all just feels so unfair. Isn't it true that sometimes we feel like forgiveness is so complicated because it's not safe for that person to be in our life anymore? And I think because for me, I always thought that forgiveness and reconciliation came as a package deal. That, I've discovered in reading the good word of God, is not true. Even when I cannot be reconciled to a person, I still must forgive them. And it's not for their sake, but for mine. I've suffered enough from being hurt, and I certainly don't want that hurt to turn into hate. Forgiveness is the very thing God designed to help heal the hurting human heart. Here's what also makes forgiveness so complicated. It's just like when I finally feel like I've forgiven someone, then I get triggered, and all that pain comes back. All the feelings of unfairness come back. Then I have this complicated situation where I thought I forgave, but now I'm just as angry and emotional as I've ever been, and so maybe I'm doing this whole forgiveness thing wrong, or hard things just keep happening with this same person, and forgiveness feels like an endorsement of their choices when in reality, I do not agree with what they're doing. I don't even think God would agree with what they're doing. And then again, I have my own issues. So what if I'm looking at all of this the wrong way? It's all so relationally complicated. As I studied the scriptures, I wanted forgiveness to make sense. But honestly, forgiveness just doesn't make sense. At least not when we try to process it with our feelings and our thoughts. In my human reasoning, forgiveness doesn't make sense at all because it feels like that the one who got hurt was then the one who had to give this unreasonable gift to the offender called forgiveness. But in God's word, we learn forgiveness isn't something we have to figure out how to do. 
Forgiveness isn't made possible by our determination. Forgiveness is made possible by our cooperation with what God has already done for us. Forgiveness, it, it isn't a cruel command of God that makes light of the hurt that people caused us. It's his gift to make right the condition of our heart so we can find peace even if the other person never changes or says they're sorry. So what exactly do I mean with this statement of cooperation with what God has already done? You see, when God's forgiveness flows to us, we then must cooperate with this gift and let it then flow through us to other people. And when we refuse to let God's forgiveness flow through us to other people, it's such a heavy weight inside of us. It's the weight of unforgiveness, which can cause so much anxiety, fear, depression, and angst that no human should have to bear. Forgiveness, it isn't dependent on the other person to make this right. It's between me and God, and it's so much more for my sake and my healing than theirs. So where do we start our Bible study on the topic of forgiveness? Where's the first time we see a human having to make the choice to react out of anger or gentleness in the Bible? When I study scripture and I'm dealing with a specific topic, I love to go back to the very first time that we see that very topic mentioned or pictured in the Bible. It's called the Law of First Mentions. And the first instance of sibling rivalry and anger between brothers is found in Genesis 4, the story of Cain and Abel. This is what Genesis chapter 4, starting in verse 1, says. Adam made love to his wife Eve. And she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Here's what I missed. I missed, in between Cain getting angry and killing his brother, that the Lord came and had a talk with Cain. And we can read about it in Genesis 4, 6, like we just did, when the Lord asked Cain, why are you angry? The word used for angry here in Hebrew could be translated as, why are you kindling this frustration? Or why are you heating up your worries? In other words, Cain. Why are you so very angry and letting that anger consume you? And then the Lord asked him in the same verse, why is your face downcast? And when I researched downcast, it's a Hebrew phrase that indicates anxiety and depression. So putting this together, the Lord is asking him, why are you heating up all of your worries and frustrations to the point where you are absolutely filled with anxiety and depression? And then suddenly, this isn't just a story about Cain and Abel. It was as if God was speaking to me, and it started to feel very personal, like the Lord was saying, Lisa, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. In verse 6, isn't it interesting that God seems less interested in addressing the source of Cain's anger and so much more interested in how his anger was affecting him? Then the Lord tells Cain not what to do in his original situation, but rather to rule over the sin crouching at his door that's now been drawn to the scene by Cain's reaction. 
So when I truly stop and take a moment to continue to make this personal to me, I have some really big questions like, how in the world am I supposed to rule over sin? And what do I do with my chaotic emotions like anger? And understandably, probably, maybe anger isn't your first response when hard things happen, but what do you do when complicated emotions get so stirred up inside of you? Well, instead of relying on any other source with such a sensitive issue, I wanted to know, what does God's word instruct? So I found a verse, Psalm 4:4, that speaks to this. Let's read it in the ESV. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts, on your beds, and be silent. So what exactly are we supposed to do on our beds? Because I've tried this, but when I go to bed at night and something is bothering me, I will just be flat out honest with you and tell you, I wanna lay there and I want to overprocess. I do not wanna be silent. My natural tendency is to stew and fret and revisit all the reasons why this is wrong and all the hard emotions that just are there. They come in and the silent part for me, it just totally gets skipped. I don't know what to do with all of this. So I asked my friend and coworker, Joel Mutamale, who is like super educated on all this theology stuff, is there another verse that I can look at to help me better understand exactly what to do when I'm laying on my bed at night? And thank goodness he knew where to go. Psalm 36. I find this so fascinating. Remember the instruction God gave to Cain about sin is crouching at your door. You must rule over it. We need to make sure to rule over sin with our mouth and our mind. So listen to what Psalm 36 says. Now, hang in here with me for just a little bit because there's some hard words, but there's also some really good words. I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. The words of their mouths are wicked and deceitful. They fail to act wisely or do good. Even on their beds, they plot evil. They commit themselves to a sinful course and do not reject what is wrong. Okay, quick clarification here. When I lay on my bed, it's not really that I'm plotting evil. I just want to teach that person a lesson or Really, I just want to mentally present my case for the way I see things or strategize ways to be more understood and more heard. But all that does is keep me focused on what I need, what I want, the way I see things. And therefore, it just keeps me spinning and all the hurt and pain. And it never gets me to the place where I want to hear God speak, which is probably what I need most of all. None of my processing and emotional worries and fretting has any kind of power, but God's words, that's where our power comes from. That's what we need to rule over sin. So let's continue on in Psalm 36. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Continue your love to those who know you your righteousness to the upright in heart. One of my other team members named Shay and I were later discussing why Joel sent me to Psalm 36. She said, I think this section of scripture tells us what we're supposed to do in our beds when we're silent. We're supposed to take our focus off of our troubles and instead focus on God because he's so capable and so much bigger he has everything we need in every situation. Think about it. God's love, 
God's faithfulness, God's righteousness, God's justice. Yes, yes, give me some justice. God's abundance, God's delight, God's fountain of life, God's light. You see, when we think on these things, we are reminded God is bigger than everything that's making us anxious. And the more we focus on God, the more focused we are on his peace. And the more we focus on his peace, the more we'll feel his peace. And then we'll be upright in heart rather than downcast in face. So I've been trying this and I'm still not able to do it perfectly, but I am doing it so much better than when I started. Here are two perspectives that Psalm 36 has really helped me finally have. First, a better understanding of who God is, and second, a better understanding of who I am. God's word is so powerfully effective. You see, God is faithful. That's who he is. I can honestly say so much of what I was worried about or situations that had stirred up so much strong emotion and I was so epically offended and so desperately hurt on this exact day one year ago, I can't remember them. And if there is still something that I can remember, well, look at where I am today. I'm I'm here, I'm learning, I'm growing. I mean, God's faithfulness is so evident in the fact that he got me from there to here. And I can whisper to myself, in so many situations where I'm so emotional, this too shall pass. It may not feel like it, but it will. And not only do I better understand who God is, but the second perspective Psalm 36 has really helped me with, a better understanding of myself. You see, for so long, I've thought in these hard situations, because I'm a rule follower and I wanna do what's right, I thought, I'm the saint and they're the sinner. But honestly, when I think of myself that way, forgiveness is nearly impossible. Because when I only think I need a little bit of God's forgiveness flowing to me, then I'm only willing to let very little forgiveness flow through me. So I can't look at myself as the saint and other people as the sinner because Jesus is really just calling us all to be servants. This kind of rush to judgment is such a running away from Scripture. Eugene Peterson paraphrases parts of Matthew 5 in the message like this, and if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. Love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. Now, I wanna show you one more thing in Genesis 4 that completely blew me away. When I go back to Genesis 4, 6 through 7, and I look again at exactly what God said to Cain, and then I did a little research around what this meant. So I'm gonna read the Lord's words, and then I'm gonna explain a little more. Remember what God said, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. When I got to verse seven of Genesis four, if you do what is right, I looked it up in Hebrew. It's translated as this, to make a thing good, right, or beautiful. Wow. That's something that I'd written in my journal right at the very beginning of this whole complicated process, that forgiveness is a complicated grace that uncomplicates my anger and helps me see beautiful again. What if these hard situations in our lives are really opportunities to grow into a better understanding of the best of who God is and the best of who we are? And I think That's just where we should end this week, just by asking the question, what if? What if I looked at this differently? What if this isn't just an obstacle, but also an opportunity? What if I believed that it's really possible with God for me to rule over the sin 
crouching at my door? What if I did what is right? Even if other people are still doing what's wrong, could I bring what is good and right and beautiful even to a hard situation like this? What if? <laughs>